visual content of this uh, video is a collection of rock art images from all over the world. The audio content are selected quotes from the book of Jane Roberts called Set Speaks. The quotes are on the subject of the history of um, what is commonly known nowadays as the land of Mu or Lemuria. Set uses another similarly sounding name, Lumania. Probably the uh, Lumanians or Lumerians or Lemurians. You think of physical history as beginning with the cavemen and continuing up to the present, but there have been other great scientific civilizations, some spoken of in legend, some completely unknown all in your terms now vanished. Groups of people in various cycles of reincarnational activity have met crisis after crisis, have come to your point of physical development and either gone beyond it, or destroyed their particular civilization. In this case they were given another chance, having the unconscious knowledge not only of their failure, but the reasons behind it. They then began with a psychological head start as they formed new primitive groupings. Others, solving the problems, left your physical planet for other points in the physical universe. When they reached that level of development, however, they were spiritually and psychically mature and were able to utilize energies of which you now have no practical knowledge. Earth to them now is the legendary home. They formed new races and species that could no longer physically accommodate themselves to your atmospheric conditions. However, they also continued on the reincarnational level as long as they inhabited Phi's reality. Some of these have mutated and have long left the reincarnational air cycle, however, those who have left it have evolved into the mental entities that they always were. You see, they have discarded material form. This group entities still takes a great interest in Earth. They lend it support and energy. In a way, they could be thought of now as Earth gods. On your planet they were involved in three particular civilizations long before the time of Atlantis when, in fact, your planet itself in a somewhat different position, particularly in relationship to three of the other planets that you know. The poles were reversed, they were, incidentally, for three long periods of your planet's his. These civilizations were highly technological, the second one being, fact, far superior to your own along those lines. Sound was utilized far more effectively not only for healing and in wars, but also to power vehicles of locomotion, and to bring about the movement of physical matter. Sound was a conveyor of weight and mass. The strength of this second civilization lay mainly in the areas now known as Africa and Australia, although at that time not only was the climate entirely different, but the land areas. There was a different attraction of land mass having to do with the altered position of the poles. Relatively speaking, however, the civilization was concentrated in area, it did not attempt to expand. It was highly engrown and dwelled upon the planet simultaneously with a large, unorganized, dispersed, primitive culture. Not only did it make no attempt to civilize the rest of the world, but it did everything in its power, which was considerable for a long period of time, to impede any such progress. The members of this civilization were largely a fringe group from the earlier successful civilization, most of whom had decided to continue existence in other areas of your physical universe. These, however, were particularly enamored of earthly life, and also thought that they could improve upon the last experiment in which they had been involved, though they were free to move on to other layers of existence. They were not interested in beginning from scratch again as an infant civilization, but in other areas. 
Therefore much of their knowledge was instinctive with them, and this particular group then went through what you would call the various technological stages very rapidly. They were particularly concerned in the beginning with developing a human being who would have built in safeguards against violence. With them, the desire for peace was almost what you would call an instinct. There were changes in the physical mechanism. When the mind signaled strong aggression, the body would not react. Now psychologically you can see vestiges of this in certain individuals, who will faint, or even attack their own physical system, before allowing themselves to do what they think of as violence to another. This civilization, therefore, left the natives that surrounded them in peace. They did send out members of their own group, however, to live with the natives and intermarry, hoping peacefully to thus alter the physiology of the species. The energy, often in your time given over to violence, went instead into other pursuits, but began to turn against them. They were not learning to deal with violence or aggression. They were attempting to short-circuit it physically, and this they found had complications. Energy must be allowed to flow freely through the physical system, controlled and directed mentally, or psychically if you prefer. The physical alteration was a strain on the entire system. The creative function and basis that has been distorted into the idea of aggression, the urge to act, was not understood. In a manner of speaking, breathing itself is a violence. The built-in inhibition resulted in a tied-up system of mutual controls in which the necessary thrusting out of action became literally impossible. An overly conscientious, restrictive mental and physical state evolved, in which the organism's natural physical need for survival was in every way hampered. Mentally, the civilization progressed. Its technology was extremely activated, and propelled onward as it strove to develop, for example, artificial foods so that it would not need to kill for survival in any way. At the same time it tried to leave the environment intact. It missed your stage of automobiles completely, and steam-driven vehicles, and concentrated rather early on sound, however. More and more of them realized that the experiment was not a success. Some, after physical death, left to join those from the previous successful civilization, who had migrated to other planetary systems within the physical structure. Large groups, however, simply left their cities, destroyed the force fields that had enclosed them and joined the many groups of relatively uncivilized peoples, mating with them and bearing children. These Lumanians died quickly, for they could not bear violence carried within themselves strong subconscious memories of their origin. I am speaking of the Lumanians now. This accounted for their quick rise, technologically speaking. But because their purpose was so single-minded, the avoidance of violence, rather, say, than the constructive peaceful development of creative potential, their experience was highly one-sided. They were driven by such a fear of violence that they dared not allow the physical system freedom even to express it. The vitality of the civilization was therefore weak not because evils of violence in earthly terms, but they would have denied the individual's right to learn this his own way, and thus prevented the individual from using his own methods, creatively, to turn the violence into constructive areas. Free will in this respect was discarded. As a child is physically protected from some diseases for a while after he emerges from his mother's womb, so for a brief period is the child cushioned against some psychic disasters for a short period after birth and carries within him, still for his comfort, memories of past existences and places. So the Lumanians for some generations were supported by deep subconscious memories of the civilization that had gone before. 
Finally, however, these began to weaken. They had protected themselves against violence but not against beliefs did, and into him they projected those qualities that they could not themselves express. He was much later to appear as the old Jehovah, the God of wrath who protected the chosen people. The fear of natural forces was, therefore, initially extremely strong in them for the reasons given, and brought about a feeling of separation between man and those natural forces that nurtured him. They could not trust the earth, since they were not allowed to protect themselves against violent forces within it. Their vast technology and their great civilization was largely underground. They were, in those terms, the original cavemen, and they came out from their cities through caves also. Caves were not just places of protection in which unskilled natives squatted. They were often doorways to and from the cities of the Lumanians. Long after the cities were deserted, the following natives, uncivilized, found these caves and the openings. In the period that you now think of as the Stone Age, the men you think of as your ancestors, the cavemen, often found shelter not in rough naturally formed caves, but in mechanically created channels that reached behind them and in the deserted cities in which once the Lumanians dwelled. Some of the tools fashioned by the cavemen were distorted versions of those they had found. While the civilization of the Lumanians was highly concentrated, in that they made no attempt to conquer others or to spread out to any great extent in area, they did set out, over the centuries, outposts from which they could emerge and keep track of the other native peoples. These outposts were constructed underground. From the original cities and large settlements there were, of course, underground connections, a system of tunnels, highly intricate and beautifully engineered. Since these were an aesthetic people, the walls were lined with paintings and drawings, and sculpture was also displayed along these inner byways. There were various escalated systems, some conveying people on foot, some conveying goods. It was not practical to construct such tunnels to the many outposts, however, which were fairly small communities and relatively self-supporting, some were a good distance away from the main areas of commerce and of activity. These outposts were situated in many scattered areas, but there were a fairly large number of them in what is now Spain and the Pyrenees. There were several reasons for this one having to do with the existence of rather giant-sized men in the mountain areas. Because of the timid nature of these, Lumanian, people, they did not enjoy outpost existence, and only the bravest and most confident of them were given such an assignment, which was temporary to begin with. The caves, again, served as doorways opening outward and often what seemed to be the back of a cave was instead constructed of a material opaque from the outside but transparent from the inside. The natives of the area, using such caves for natural shelter, could therefore be observed without danger. These people reacted to sounds that are not audible to your ears. Their peculiar fear of violence intensified all of their mechanisms to an amazing degree. They were forever alert and on guard. This is difficult to explain, but they could mentally pitch a thought along certain frequencies, a highly distinguished art, and then translate the thought at a given destination in any of a number of ways, into form or color, for example, or even into a certain type of image. Their language was extremely discriminating in ways that you could not understand simply because gradations in pitch, frequency, and spacing were so precise and complicated. Communication, in fact, was one of their strongest points and it was developed to such a high degree simply because they feared violence so deeply and were constantly on the alert. 
they banded together in large family groups, again in need for protection. Contact between children and parents was at a very high level, and children were acutely uncomfortable if out of the sight of their parents for any amount of tune. For these reasons, those individuals who ran the outposts felt themselves to be in a very uncomfortable situation. They were limited in numbers and largely cut off from the main areas of their own civilization. They developed, therefore, an even greater telepathic activity, and a rapport with the earth above their head, so that the slightest tremor or footstep and the most minute movements above that were not usual, were instantly noted. There were frequent peepholes, so to speak, through to the surface, from which they could make observations, and cameras situated there that kept the most precise pictures not only of the earth but of the stars. Of course, they had complete records of underground gas areas and intimate knowledge of the inner crusts, keeping careful watch upon and anticipating earth tremors and faults. They were as triumphant about their descent into the earth as any race ever was who left the earth. This was, as I told you, the second and perhaps most interesting of the three civilizations. The first followed generally your own line of development and faced many of the problems that you now do. They were largely situated in what you call Asia Minor, but they were also expansive and traveled outward to other areas. These are the people I mentioned earlier, who finally went on to other planets within other galaxies, and from whom the people of the Lumanian civilization came. Before we discuss the third civilization, there are a few more points I would like to make about the second one. This has to do with communication as it was applied to their drawings and paintings, and to the highly discriminating channels that their creative communications could take. In many ways their art was highly superior to your own and not as isolated. The various art forms, for example, were connected in a fashion that is nearly unknown to you, and because you are so unfamiliar with the concept, it will be rather difficult to explain. Consider, for example, something very simple, say a drawing of an animal. You would perceive it simply as a visual object, but these people were great synthesizers. A line was not simply a visual line, but according to an almost infinite variety of distinctions and divisions, it would also represent certain sounds that would be automatically translated. An observer could automatically translate the sounds before he bothered with the visual image if he wanted to. In what would appear to be a drawing of an animal, then, the entire history or background of the animal might also be given. Curves, angles, lines all represented, beside their obvious objective function in a drawing, a highly complicated series of variations in pitch, tone and value or if you prefer, invisible words. Distances between lines were translated as sound pauses, and sometimes also as distances in time. Color was used in terms of language and communication, in drawings and paintings, representing somewhat as your own color does, emotional gradations. The color however, its value of intensity, served to further refine and define, for example, either by reinforcing the message already given by the objective value of the lines, angles, and curves, and by the invisible word messages already explained, or by modifying these in any given number of ways. The size of such drawings also spoke its own message. In one way this was a highly stylized art and yet it allowed of both great preciseness of expression in terms of detail, and great freedom in terms of scope. It was obviously highly compressed. 
This technique was later discovered by the third civilization, and some of the remnants of drawings done in imitation of it still exist. But the keys to interpretation have been completely lost, so all you could see would be a drawing devoid of the multisensual elements that gave it such great variety. It exists, but you could not bring it alive. I should perhaps mention here that some of the caves, particularly in certain areas of Spain and the Pyrenees, and some earlier ones in Africa, were artificial constructions. Now these people moved mass with sound, and, as I told you earlier, actually conveyed matter through a high mastery of sound. This is how their tunnels were originally formed, and it was also the method used to form some of the caves in areas where originally there were few. Often drawings on the cave walls were highly stylized information, almost like signs in your terms in front of public buildings, portraying the type of animals and beings in a given area. These drawings later were used as models by your early cavemen in the historical times to which you usually refer. Their communicative abilities, and therefore creative abilities, were more vital, alive, and responsive than yours are. When you hear a word you may be aware of a corresponding image in your mind. With these people, However, sounds automatically and instantly built up an amazingly vivid image that was not three-dimensional by any means, being internalized, but was far more vivid than your usual mental images indeed. Certain sounds, again, were utilized to indicate amazing distinctions in terms of size, shape, direction, and duration both in space and time. Sounds automatically produced brilliant images, in other words. For this reason there was an easy distinction between what was called inner sight and outer sight, and it was quite natural for them to close their eyes when seated in conversation in order to communicate more clearly, enjoying the ever-changing and immediate inner images that accompanied any verbal interchange. They learned quickly and education was an exciting process, because this multisensuous facility automatically impressed information upon them not simply through one sense channel at a time but utilizing many simultaneously. For all this, however, and the immediacy of their perceptions, there was an inherent weakness. The inability to face up to violence and learn to conquer it meant of course, that they also severely hampered a certain thrusting out characteristic. Energy was blocked in these areas so that they actually lacked a forceful quality or sense of power. I do not necessarily mean physical power however, but so much of their energy was used to avoid any meeting with violence that they were not able to channel ordinary aggressive feelings, for example, into other areas. I have been speaking about the Lumanians in some detail because they are a part of your psychic heritage. The other two civilizations were in many ways more successful, and yet the strong intent behind the Lumanians experiment was extremely volatile. While they were not able to solve the problem of violence as they understood it in your reality, their passionate desire to do so still rings throughout your own psychic environment. Because of the true nature of time, the Lumanians still exist as they were in your terms. They are often bleed-throughs in the psychic atmosphere. These do not occur by chance, but when some kind of rapport causes effects to leap between systems that otherwise appear quite separated. And so there have been such bleed-throughs between your own civilization and the Lumanians. Various old religions picked up the idea of the Lumanians' fierce god figure for example, in whom they managed to project their concepts of force, power, and violence, this god who had meant to protect them when non-violence would not allow them to protect themselves. There is a bleed through now in the making, so to speak in which the Lumanians' multidimensional concepts of art and communication will be glimpsed by your own people, but in a rudimentary form. 
because of the nature of probabilities there is also, of course, a system of reality in which the Lumanians succeeded in their experiment with non-violence, and in which a completely different type of human being emerged. All of this may seem very strange to you, simply because your concepts of existence are so specific and limiting. Ideas of probable realities and probable men and gods may strike some of you as quite absurd, and yet as you read this book, you are but one of the probable yous. Other probable yous would not consider you real, of course, and some might indignantly question your existence. Nevertheless, the probable system of reality is not just a philosophical question. If you are interested in the nature of your own reality, then it becomes a highly personal and pertinent matter.